Welcome to The Red Velvet Woman. This is a podcast for women who want to build a beautiful life after toxic narcissistic relationships. I am obsessed with assisting these women who are on the verge of change to help them transform their lives by getting unstuck, stepping into your power and unlocking the best version of you and ultimately fulfilling your potential after breaking free from your narcissistic ex. I am going to help you empower yourself to heal, recover and redesign your thoughts and energy so that you flourish into the beautiful and amazing person you always were underneath and are going to be again. But this version of you is going to be bigger and better. This is for those babes who are ready to leave their limits at the door and level up. Your life is about to change, so get ready. I have personally gone from confusion to clarity and from survive to thrive. And guess what? So can you. I am your host, Olivia Powell. I'm a life coaching student, a registered nurse and midwife, business owner, YouTuber, and the creator of The Red Velvet Woman. I am so happy that you're here. Let's do this together. Hi, Kelly, and welcome to the podcast. How are you going today? Hi, thank you so much for having me. That's okay. I'm so excited to finally have you on. So people that are listening, basically, I had messaged Kelly back in, I think it was December, around Christmas time. I was like, hey, would you like to hop on for a podcast interview? And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's just been so flat out since then. We've just had scheduling issues and whatnot, but we finally made it, which is super exciting. I'm happy to have you on. So thanks for joining me. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited that we were able to connect and I can't wait to do this today. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's all good. I'm so excited to have you on. Um, so people that don't know Kelly Smith, basically she's a relationship coach and she's an author. So today we're going to talk about Kelly's story, how she was affected by narcissism, how she got into doing what she's doing now and what her book is all about. So take it away. How did it kind of start in your life with narcissistic people? Who was the narcissist in your life, Kelly? Oh, you know, I met my very first narcissist October 4th, 1976, the day I was born. So my mom <laughs> um, didn't know I was being born into such a mess. I had no idea until, I guess until I started growing up, my mom was the one who taught me to chase love, how to beg for love, that I wasn't really good enough. And no matter how hard I tried, it was such a tough situation with her. So because of that and feeling like I'm not good enough, that led me into toxic relationships, not only with romance and stuff like that, but also friendships. Mm. So I would let friends walk all over me and chase them to love me and beg them somebody because that's what I thought. That's what I thought was normal. But then it did happen where, um, because of the way she was, I learned from her how to also be toxic because I watched her abuse my dad. So when I got into my first relationship, I picked up those same unhealthy habits and it was very abusive to the guy who eventually became my husband, who's now my ex-husband. Wow. So basically all your life you've been affected by narcissistic relationships because your mother was one. Yeah, I've been affected my entire life. And then after my divorce, I jumped into a relationship way too fast. Yeah. Know, so needy, so codependent, couldn't be on my own. Yep. And that guy actually was the one who gave me sort of like the karma that I deserved, taught me a super solid lesson about the way that I was treating people. So it kind of opened my eyes to how abusive I was. Yeah. Being abused kind of like, yeah, opened my eyes to a lot of different things. So do you think you'd have been like one way in terms of being codependent and then you swung the complete opposite direction and became like the abuser? Is that how you think it kind of went about? For me, it did. Yeah. So because I was so codependent, because I was so needy, because I was so controlling, that made me super toxic. And the relationship I was in with my ex-husband was just, you know, miserable. Miserable for both of us because it takes so much energy to be such a control freak. It takes so much energy to be codependent on another human. It literally sucks the life out of you. So if it's sucking the life out of you and you're the one doing it, can you imagine what it's doing to the other person? Yes. Oh my gosh. There, yeah just complete misery. Then the worst part about that was I have three sons. So they saw me abuse their dad, but then they also saw their dad take it. Right. So was your partner at the time codependent then? I don't know if he was codependent or if he was just, this is just how life is. Yeah. I'm not a hundred percent sure like what he was thinking on his end, but on my end, um, it was a really bad situation. So when I got out of it and started to get abused, I remember thinking, and actually saying to my ex-husband one day, I think I met the male version of me. And he was like, you need to get out of that relationship as soon as possible. Then I stayed a lot longer than I should have, well past the expiration date, because I felt like I deserved it for all the things I did to my ex-husband. Wow. So how long were you in those relationships for, Kelly? Um, I was married for about 18 years, and mm -hmm. I was with him for over 20. 
and then the next relationship from soup to nuts i'm gonna say maybe five years yeah so they're both long-term relationships yeah yeah, yeah wow so how do you feel about like those people so like how do you feel about your mom and then you know your exes and like yourself how do you feel about how that was all conducted that's a great question because i feel like there's a part of me that like the kid in me is still so confused mm -hmm. like wait how does a mom not like automatically like, love the kid like how does that happen the adult in me understands the stuff that she's been through the abuse she probably went through the you know, mental issues that she has, that sort of thing. But it's literally almost every day, it's a tug of war for me mm -hmm. because I, you know, big things will happen in my life where I'm excited where you want your mom, but then sad things happen and you want your mom. But then, you know, if you turn to your mom, it's just going to end just disastrous. Mm -hmm. So it's a tough thing. I made peace with both relationships that I was in. So I don't have any good feelings. I don't have any bad feelings. I don't really have any feelings about it, but I do still struggle to forgive myself for a lot of stuff that I did, especially what I showed my kids. That's a really tough one for me. Like exposure sort of thing. Yeah. So they saw me being abusive, but then they saw me getting abused. They saw a lot of stuff. They picked me up off the floor a lot. They saw the bruises on my body. They saw the way somebody would talk to me. And I think it was so hard for them because they felt like they wanted to do something, but they were scared of this guy and they didn't yeah. know what to do. So I expose them to a lot of stuff that I'm not proud of, which is a huge reason why I wrote my book, because I think a lot of people don't understand that when you're in a relationship like that, there are so many different facets to it, where it's not just you and like what's going on with you, it's what's going on with your friends, your family, your kids, and everyone that's around you. So not everyone can see all the sides of it. 100%. And that's something I've touched on before is like, just because you've accepted abuse or toxicity in one area of your life, it rarely means that it's just that one component of your life. Usually right. it's, you know, across the board in some capacity, you know, like yeah. it's just, you can't help it because if that's the person that you bring to the table in that area, usually speaking, it happens across other areas as well, such as like accepting bad behavior from your current partner or your ex-husband or whatever, but mm -hmm. then also friends and then sometimes workplaces and all that sort of stuff. Like it's a thing that happens, yeah, across all those areas. And until you kind of work on your internal world and change all of that and tweak it, that's when the external world stuff changes. Because even though you can compartmentalize, when it comes to your codependency or whatever, you can't really do that in just one area, is what I feel. Yeah, I agree with you. It comes from everywhere. So if you have one toxic relationship in your life, I feel chances are you have multiple toxic relationships in life. I think when totally. people hear about toxic relationships, they do relate it specifically to relationships, romantic relationships. Yeah. And they don't want to see that it could be friends and family. I think the friends that are toxic they hide in plain sight. Mm -hmm. So recently I've ended three relationships with people, friends, because they were so toxic. The crazy thing about it is I haven't missed anyone. I haven't been like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. I've been like, thank God these people are gone. Yeah. If you feel like you've kind of cut them off and it hasn't impacted you in a bad way, you kind of know it's been the right decision. Do you know what I mean? Like if you feel lighter and you have more energy, it's yes. the right decision. It's not the wrong decision. Yes, I totally agree with that. I haven't missed one <laughs> of these people. And I was friends with one of my friends for a good 15 years, have not to this day, it's been over a year now and I have not missed her once. Never once did I try to like pick up the phone to call her. I'm like, oh my goodness, she's out of my life. I didn't realize how toxic she was until she was gone. And it's hard too, because when you're having issues with your narcissist partner or ex, like you go to your friends for advice yes. and for help. And so if they're toxic too, it's kind of a dead end. It kind of feeds into that even more. And then it kind of leaves you sometimes even more codependent because mm -hmm. you've gone to your partner for help or your ex and that hasn't worked. And then you go to your friends for advice and help there. And you know, they can only give as much as what they can give and what they understand. And they're not in your shoes. They haven't necessarily experienced the same thing you have. And then because usually they, not all of them, but some of them can be toxic. It's like you sit in that codependent space again, because they're used to you being a certain way. They don't want to see you mistreated necessarily, but they're used to perhaps in your relations with them, them getting what they want and you just going along with things or not speaking up for yourself or mm -hmm. whatever. So you kind of like are getting it from two ends. And then if you have a parent or a family member that's also narcissistic, it just feels like you just can't breathe sometimes. Like you're just suffocating and you've got nowhere to turn to. And that's why these support groups are so important and relationship coaches are so important and getting the word out there that there are people out there that go through this and help other people with it is so important as well. And it's funny you touched on narcissistic mothers because when I first, I guess, started to learn more about narcissism and all sort of stuff, 
I just started to realise more and more how many narcissistic mothers there were because there are so many support groups online for daughters and sons from narc mums. And it's really interesting because it's like there are thousands, thousands and thousands. And so, yeah, I just thought it was a really interesting observation. And more often than not, when you discover one person's narcissistic, you start to open your eyes to all the abuse tactics and stuff from other people that make you realise they're narcs as well, or they're toxic at least. Well, I think the thing with the narcissistic family is people are so used to, society teaches us that. And I think it's a generational thing as well, where if it's your mom or your dad, it's okay. People can treat you like crap as long as you're related to them. Like if you have a toxic mom who treats you horribly, you're just like, oh, that's my mom. What am I supposed to do? So this is what I started saying, where I had my mom who was, you know, super abusive to me. And then I had an ex that was super abusive to me, right? So I had said to one of my friends one day, I'm like, someone in my life called me and they want me to come back and talk to them. They called me names. They were abusive to me. They put me down. They made me feel less than. I wasn't important enough. All this. I'm like, should I call them back? And you say to them, like, like, well, who was it? If I said to them, it was my ex, Gabe. No, 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 no. Don't call that guy back. However, if I say that was my mom, well, yeah, you should call her back. Really? So they did the exact same things to me and I should call my mom back. Let me ask you why. Why, why do I call her back? Because she's your mom and she deserves that. And I think it's worse that a mom does it than an ex. Only because your mom gave birth to you. Mm. Like you lived inside her and she still is treating you that way. And chances are... She's been treating you that way since early on. So I really feel like it's unfair to tell someone that just because it's their mom or their dad or their sibling, they have to give them another try. Because I tried. My two youngest siblings had an intervention with me. And they were like, you have to stop going back to her. Yeah. Because I tried for years and years. And it was the most excruciating, painful thing to put yourself through was when you just want your mom to love you and accept you. And she just doesn't. Yeah. Wants to change you. Or wants you to succumb to the way they want you to act or be or behave, yeah. Yeah. It's a different formula because with a partner, like I know it sounds horrible, but at the end of the day, you can cut them off and you may not have to have any contact with them. Even if you do have kids, you've still got that link, yeah. but you're you're not from them. You've had an experience with them in this life. Whereas a parent, yeah, you've been born into that social system. They've taught you and they've raised you and they're supposed to be those people that are there for you. That's supposed to lead you and guide you through life. And then if you're getting misled or misguided, like, you know, you can cut them off. You can not have contact with them. But at the end of the day, you can't change the fact that you're still biologically related. You know, it's right. your choice whether you want to have a relationship or not. But at the same mm-hmm. time, it's hard to fully escape because everybody has a mum. Everybody has a dad, even if they're alive or they're not alive because everyone's got to come from somewhere. You know, whereas yeah. a partner, at the end of the day, you can get divorced. You can leave them. You can cut your ties somewhat unless you've got kids, but, you know, that's a little bit more complicated. But a parent is a whole other kettle of fish, yeah. It really is, and it was a tough decision for me to finally do that and make peace with it. And the good news is I found other people who have done the same thing. It's not an easy decision to make, but regardless of who they are in your life, you should never allow anyone to make you feel that way. And it's really tough. I have days where it's tough to get through because I wish I had someone like that in my life that I could turn to. And I don't. So I've learned to be super independent on my own and take care of myself. And sometimes that's hard, but at the same time, if I hold on to it too much, you know, I won't be able to get through my days. Exactly. And you've got to think of it like this, like, you know what you've missed out on. So you can be that person that you've wanted, but for your own kids. The stuff that you miss out on, that's excruciating. I've often asked myself out loud, like for a person who's never truly been loved, how on earth do I give so much love? You know, I was talking to my son the other day. He had called me for some advice and I was giving him some pretty solid advice, I thought. And I was like, (laughs) I don't know where this stuff comes from. He's like, I don't need that. He's like, but you're so good at it. And he's like, I'm so grateful that you're my mom. Yeah. You know, and that was such a really nice thing because I never had anything like that. That's so good. I think too, because when you've been lacking in something, you know what you've been lacking in. So you know what to give as well. It may not come naturally if you've gone without, but you just got to flip it over and be like, if this is what I've gotten, this is what I need to give as a mother. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Or as a partner or whatever, you know what the opposite is. And I guess it makes yeah. it more easy to identify and focus on that because it's not like you've had it and you've taken it for granted. It's like when you do get bits and pieces of that, you notice it and you cherish it and you're grateful for it. And then, you know, the right people in your life, you'll give that to. Yeah, I will 100% agree with that statement. Yep. Okay, so firstly, how did you realize that your ex was a narcissist? That's a loaded question right there. Oh my goodness. How much time do we have on this? <laughs> Before I met that person, when someone would say to me, like, narcissistic, I thought of somebody who was vain, somebody yeah. who, like, the way they looked, that sort of thing. I didn't realize that it was an actual, like, personality disorder. I had no idea it was a mental illness. 
I didn't really start putting the pieces together until maybe three or four months into the relationship. Wow. But then as I started to kind of put it in, like put the pieces together, I was like, wait, because you, it was like hit or miss because they can kind of change and they manipulate and they do all these different things. So it wasn't until, you know, much later where I was like, wow, this guy really is. Well, you know how you learn to get to know people. So over time, things would spill out. Like mm -hmm. he was pretty much bipolar. He was unmedicated. He, you know, was diagnosed with different illnesses. And it was such a roller coaster. I literally didn't want a degree in psychology. You know what I mean? Like that's not <laughs> what you get into a relationship for. That's essentially what ended up happening. Where now I know all these different terms and different things. But, and it was amazing for me to find out the line of people in my life that also have that. Yes. And even with the bipolar thing, there's so many comorbidities now that go along with narcissism. Like it's just from what I can gather as well. And this hasn't been a personal experience of mine because my ex never had an official diagnosis. I just had to symptom match everything. And it all was like hundred percent down to the T, you know, NPD. But a lot of the women that I'm finding in these groups are like talking about how their partner has had addiction issues, bipolar problems, schizophrenia, all those other mental health conditions. And I'm finding it is quite rare that you just have, you know, one person with NPD. It's like they've got a multitude of factors going on at once, which can make it even more confusing to narrow down because you've got all these other symptoms thrown in there as well. The addiction runs rampant. It's yeah. ridiculous. I didn't realize, I didn't know what the signs of different like addictions were. I knew what alcohol addiction looked like. I knew what drug addiction looked like, but I did not know what sex addiction looked like. And I actually just started writing my second book and it's a continuation of my first book. So I'm writing more about the signs that I missed and what those actually look like. And I'm writing this and I'm still sort of in shock because I'm a fairly intelligent person that missed all of the signs. But if you don't know what you're looking for, you won't be able to see it. So I had no idea at the time what signs of sex addiction look like. Yeah. And like, you've just touched on a good point there as well, where it's like people sometimes assume, and I'm not saying a lot of people do this, but they kind of think, oh, because you've been taken by a ride for a narcissist, you mustn't be very smart or intelligent or whatever. But that's actually not true. They are very, very masterful manipulators and they know how to target successful, smart, intelligent, educated women as well. It's not just you know, one type of woman, like these people are, oh, they're so crafty and they know what you want and they can identify that and they can become that person for you, but they're actually well, not that person. You know, a really great example of that, of them targeting certain people, certain women will just say, because so many women are narcissistic as well, but totally with me and my relationship, the funny thing about this, like, since I have everything out there with my book anyway, I might as well just have everything. Well, you might as well. <laughs> might as well, right? I mean, my face is on it and everything. So when I first met this person, when, I, when stuff started to go south, all I literally had to do was hang up the phone because it was long distance. I had my own money, my own house, my own car, my own career, my own job, everything. Mm -hmm. I had everything I needed. I didn't need to be with someone like that. And he was 1,700 miles away. So yeah. all I needed to do was hang up the phone. And instead of doing that, I mean, the manipulation was so strong and so severe that I didn't do those things that I could easily have walked away. I had an amazing support system. I had people in my life, you know, that were there for me. And I still stayed mm -hmm. until my life was literally in ruin, like complete yeah. ruin where like at the end of it, my bank account was empty and you know, it was, my life was shattered into a million pieces and I was a very strong person going into this. And then I wasn't at the end. I was a shell of a human by the end of it. Yeah, those words have fallen out of my mouth before as well, like a shell of a human. Totally. Yeah. Oh my gosh, 100%. Yeah. yeah, you have bones and you have guts, but you have nothing left. And it was a tough go, it was a tough recovery. But the big thing that I don't think a lot of people talk about is the recovery. I think a lot of people like to talk about the abuse that happened, the men or women that do it, but they spend so much time talking about what they went through versus, or I guess I should say talking about like the person that did this to them instead of recovering. So my recovery was unbelievable. It was something I don't know how I even got through that. It was touch and go for a while there, honestly, but it's something that we need to focus on. We do. And that's the thing, like when you come out of it and you are in victim mode, cause you're like, you're saying how these awakenings where you're like, Oh my gosh, I was targeted. Oh my gosh, you did this to me. And this will make sense now. And da da da, how can you do that to me? And it's all like this victim, victim, victim. And they're the perpetrator, which they are. I'm not saying they're not, they totally are. They've done wrong by you for sure. But at the same yeah. time, you get some people that stay stuck on blaming, blaming, blaming them and focusing on them rather than going, 
oh shit, how did I get myself in this in the first place? Yes. What have I got to do to avoid that from happening again? What areas do I need to work on so I can attract a healthy partner? Like, yeah, that's, yes. that's the thing, focus, where focus goes, energy flows. So if you're focusing on how much you don't like them and what they've done to you, that's where you're going to stay. Whereas if you're focusing on the recovery and healing yourself and getting your mindset back and your, you know, your health back and your finances, you know, like ticking along there nicely. Like that's the stuff that'll come about. Like that's what you're going to manifest as opposed to, yeah, all the other stuff. Well, you know, what's interesting was the day it finally ended. And I remember it was a rough go because it got super like abusive. And I remember laying on the floor in my bedroom and he had gone and my house was trash. I mean, it was really bad. I remember laying on the floor in my bedroom and I was like, what about this is my responsibility? I mean, mm. I'm laying there, I'm bruised and I'm, you know, in pain and my house is just a rest. And I'm like, what is my accountability in this? What did I do wrong in order to have this in my life? I don't know how I got up the floor that day. I don't know, but I somehow managed it and got to this point where I am today. I've taken a lot of accountability with this relationship and the things that I did wrong and the things that I allowed. I allowed so much. And I think once we figure out like what we're allowing people to do to us and how we're allowing people to treat us, then we need to make some changes. It literally isn't easy. It's the, what was the most difficult thing I've ever had to do was to get up that day in particular and put one foot in front of the other, but I managed it. And life is so much better now after going through recovery, after facing everything. And that's what my next book is about is a lot about my recovery and step-by-step step and how I did it and how one foot was put in front of the other. And I didn't walk to a cliff, you know, <laughs> and the, the light at the end of the tunnel wasn't a train you know so it was like it was so difficult to do it but so necessary not a hundred percent sure why i decided this would be great to share with literally the entire world but i did because so, it helped people um, you know it's at first it made people really mad because a lot of people were i guess seeing themselves in the book in my own story but then lately it's been doing what it's supposed to do it's getting where it needs to go so i'm super proud of it I was giving out books to people. I mean, I was sending books all over the world to people who were just like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I need to read your book. And I just sent them. For me, it's not about making money. It's not about any of that. It's helping the one person who's bruised and bleeding on their floor, trying to think like, how am I going to recover from this? Yeah. And it's not like a quick, you don't bounce back like a normal breakup. It's not like no. it's ended and you feel sad for a while, but you make peace with it and you move on. It's more like, oh my God, how am I ever going to be normal again? I don't know if I'm ever going to be happy again. How am I going to feel like me again? Like they're big, profound questions that you're asking yourself and you don't bounce back because you are on like a weaning off process. And that's part of getting rid of the trauma bonds. Like you have to detach yourself. You have to have the no contact. You have to wean yourself off that love drug that they've been giving you and been feeding you and been forcing upon you and then once you kind of start to realize that that started to go down in your system you can start to rebuild as well like I know for myself I felt better once I actually finally did have the breakup because it was a long time coming once I had that finality and I actually knew where I finally stood it was like half of me bounced back really quick and the other part was being dragged behind I felt like I was in this weird limbo for a really long time where I was like thank god I'm relieved I'm cut free you know I'm free as a bird I can do what I want you know it was all of that hyper awesome, high vibe, euphoric stuff. But at the same time, there was a part of me back here that was like, why is it so hard to move on from? Why am I so exhausted? Why can't I work through these issues? And so the recovery took a long time. Like how long do you think your recovery took or are you still going through it? I'm still going through it. I'll be going through it. I mean, I still hit my weekly meetings yeah. and I'm five years in. So every week I go once a month, I still see my therapist. It's the thing that a lot of people don't understand. I think a lot of people feel like you can get to a certain point in your quote unquote good. No, no, you're not good because I still have PTSD. Yeah. I still have things that trigger me. I still have things that are really difficult for me to get through. And I'm getting a lot healthier with every meeting I go to. This past week, I've had three different people tell me that they are so amazed with the changes that they're still seeing in me. And wow. it's, um, it's, it's interesting to me. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting sort of thing. But this recovery is where it's at. But like, just to touch on what you were saying, you're so right. It's not something where, okay, this guy's gone now. Like, oh, now I can breathe again. That's no, you literally can't breathe again because you do have the PTSD symptoms. And a lot of people don't understand that. A lot of people don't understand like what they're going through. And then if they don't take the time to like recover and figure some stuff out, they'll go from relationship to relationship. And then we have all these women saying, oh, all men suck. When that's not even accurate. All men no. do not suck. No, it's not true. Not at all. And just because you're on the other side of that relationship, just because your bags are packed 
and you're on the other side of the door, that doesn't mean that you're okay. And the problem is like a lot of friends and family encourage you to get out. Once you get out, they think you're good. Yeah. And then their encouragement <laughs> and their health and you know, everything else, they don't check on you anymore. They think you're fine. They want to know why you're not dating. They want to know why you're not acting the same way. And you don't even know why, because yeah. you've gone through absolute hell, you know, and depending on how long you were in, it just gets worse. I agree. And that's the thing, like they think the acute part is over because it's like, oh, you're no longer under their influence of like abuse and toxicity and, you know, all that manipulation stuff that they do. They think, oh, once you're out, okay, you know, maybe a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months and then they'll be right. But it's like, mm -hmm. no, not really. Like you actually still need a lot of, probably not more support, but support in a different way after it's over. It's yeah. not like, yeah, you definitely do. It's not just like, oh, it's over now. She'll be right, mate. It's all good. It's like, okay, now she needs to actually start licking her wounds and start healing herself, not just being out of it and looking for the next guy. Like, that's the worst thing you can do. And I, that's what I find a lot of codependents do. They jump out of that relationship. That's how they get into that pattern and that cycle of abuse as well. They jump out of one relationship, don't have any self-reflection on how they ended up in that relationship in the first place because they've blamed the narcissist the whole time. Right. And they've kind of been single for a little bit, feel a bit better, then they attract someone else in their life and they're in a relationship with them. And it turns out to be something similar, maybe a little bit about the same. It might not be physically abusive, but it might be mentally abusive as well. And then they jump into the next relationship after that. So it's just jumping, jumping, jumping. Nothing's getting looked at. Nothing's getting identified. Nothing's getting fixed or worked through. So I really appreciate your honesty then when you were saying that you've you know, been in therapy for five years. It's yeah. not like you just get a few counseling sessions sometimes and you're over and done with like, for me, I didn't actually see a therapist, but I think in hindsight, I wish I had because it would have helped me work through things a lot quicker than what I did thinking I could just do it on my own. And that's the thing. There's no shame in seeing a therapist. There's no shame in therapy or seeking out help at all. You know, it's helpful. It's there for a reason. Oh, if I could go every day for seven hours, oh, sign me up. Are you kidding me? <laughs> like, I love that. I love it. It just, it helps me so much. Because the thing, what happens is after you get out of it, something toxic and then you recover from it, life goes on, right? But then you have to learn how to live in recovery. You have to learn how to live after a toxic relationship. You have to learn to not make the same mistakes. But then you have to figure out like when your gut is a bowl of scrambled eggs, like how do you know to listen to me or not? You know what I mean? Like you don't know if you're making the right decisions or not. Like, like I feel like this is the right thing because everyone says, well, no, you know what? Like well, dating, just listen to your gut. My gut? Yeah, no, my gut's gone. My gut's in a mess, you know? And it's like, I have to rely on my brain and my brain is like, no, dude, just stay home. So it's a really tough thing. So like the continuing recovery isn't just for getting out of the relationship, the toxic relationship, or recover from that. It's also living while you were in something like that, because I've been out of that for a very long time now, no contact for a very long time. And there are things that still affect me. I was at home today and my doorbell rang out of nowhere. My hat dropped, you know, like, uh oh, what's on the other side of that door? So it's a thing where you have to learn how to live with it and learn how to be healthy and happy after something like that. And that takes a while. Once you figure out why you stayed, why you allowed it, once you finally figure out how to get out, then you have to recover from all that and then live with it. It's not an easy thing, which is why I love writing this stuff. I don't love exposing myself as much, but I'm learning that it does help a decent amount of people. It will. It definitely will because there's not enough, like awareness is increasing now, but there's still not enough of it. So books like yours is definitely going to help spread the word for sure. Just when you were talking, I just thought of a, a story that happened recently that I would just share. So I had a friend that does, you know, business sort of thing. And he reached out to me and he said, oh, you know, I've got this girl or woman that's on my team. Um, she's doing great. However, she's just disclosed to me that she's been trouble making phone calls. And I'm like, okay. And I'm thinking, why are you telling me this? You know, how can I help? <laughs> and he's like, so it turns out that she was with a narcissist and they've broken up now and it's been quite a few months and whatever, but she's having a lot of trouble. And like with this particular business, you have to be calling clients and you have to be doing cold calling and all this sort of stuff and receiving phone calls. And she had no problem making the call when it came to receiving phone calls, she just wasn't picking up the phone. So she was missing out on all these clients and sales and profits and all this sort of stuff. And it was impacting the business on a bigger, grander scale. And so he reached out to me on her behalf and just said, you know, turns out she's nervous to answer the phone because she feels like it's that automatic trigger reaction of when her ex used to call her. So she'd only ever received phone calls from him. And like she would from family, but they texted more than anything, but he'd call her and would call up and like abuse her or get upset with her or yell at her, scream at her, name call, 
whatever, you know, and if she didn't answer the phone call, she would actually be given a larger serve of all that abuse. So she was taught that she had to answer the phone call and get abused. And if she didn't, she was going to get more of that. So it was kind of like a lose lose for her. Yeah. So long story short, she hasn't reached out to me yet, but that's only really fresh. So it just goes to show that you don't know how it's going to affect you afterwards. Like even receiving phone calls, as simple as receiving a phone call can be triggering for someone and who wants to live their life like that? You know, she's only young. She's in her early twenties. She's got the rest of her life to live, you know, and if she doesn't through that, that's going to have a massive impact on her long-term. Yeah. It's a tough thing with that sort of thing because it's so true. If you don't take the call for me anyway, my situation, if you don't take the call, where are you? You know, all this stuff that you just get into so much trouble with. But then if you do take the call, you don't know who or what is on the other side of that. You literally don't. Yeah. I know I had issues as well with that. I remember when I broke up, I stopped answering the phones for a bit. I let people just go to voice message and I'd text them back or I'd call them back when I was more comfortable, you know, and just that simple impact is, it's huge. Like it means a lot. But moving on from that, tell me a bit more about your book. So you've written two. What was the first one about and what's the second one about? So the first one, Signs in the Review Mirror, Leaving a Toxic Relationship Behind. It's essentially my life story, I guess you could say, about yeah. how I got into a toxic relationship. And then when I started writing this, I intended it to be mainly about my relationship with my ex. But as I wrote and recovered, I realized it really started with my mom. Mm -hmm. So it would go back to all these different triggering things. And while I was writing this, I was a night writer. So I was up all night long. I usually would start writing at 10 p.m. Wouldn't finish till 3, 4, 5 in the morning. And when I did that, it was almost like an exorcism, if you will. Like the screaming, the crying. I felt like it was coming out of my pores. Sometimes I would just like shut my laptop and just cry for three or four hours because you're reliving all of it. And while I was writing this, it wasn't even like, I was feeling it like as myself, it was reliving it and watching a person like that I now care about go through all this. And I knew what was happening to her, which was me. I knew what was coming. And there were so many times when I was writing it and I was like, oh my God, no, like, what are you doing? You know, and it was really tough. So it was a tough write. Now that this book has been out for a year, you can get it on Amazon, Audible. And there's a bookstore in Australia that has it. Oh, I can't think of the name of it. I don't know, oh. actually. Because I was looking for it. I, I Google searched myself. I sometimes do that. And I find that my book will be in like different countries. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. So there is one on the shelf in a bookstore that I, I should have done a little more research and remembered which bookstore, but it is there somewhere. Um, but Amazon, Audible, I've read it for Audible myself. Um, That's super cool. That's what I'd like to do as well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it was definitely a process. It was definitely really fun. So so the second book is a continuation of the first book. So I'm nine chapters into this one. I'm hoping it'll be released. I don't, I don't really know when, so I got to still talk to my publisher about it. But when I do release it, I can sell it with the first book. So you get the first and second. So the second book is basically the aftermath of what happens after you write a book like that. So there's, without giving too, too much away, there was some fallout with you know the ex that I write about in the book mm -hmm. and like what happened after that. So I started writing about that and then I started writing about dating and like what that's like and my turning point in dating and like the horrible dates that I went on that eventually led me to healthy dating and how that looks. And then when you like meet someone and you have to walk that path. Like if you think of like walking the path of a relationship from two normal people, I say normal who weren't abused, the normal stuff that they would go through, like a first fight or a first serious talk or the first weekend away or something like that, those are all normal things people to get through. Now, when you're dealing with someone that was in a, an abusive relationship who's used to being cheated on and manipulated, it's a whole new world. Mm -hmm. So it's walking this path and what that feels like for someone on this side who is experiencing all these things that should just be like normal, like, oh, hey, you're going away for the weekend. Yep. Okay. Have fun. And you're like, oh, wait, wait a minute, wait, and you stress and you have anxiety and you're like, wait, what's going on? And you just don't know, you know, how to handle those things, which is why continuing in recovery is so helpful because awesome. you can turn to your sponsor, you can turn to your therapist and you can say, okay, this is what I'm walking through right now. How do I handle this? But so many people don't take the time to heal and recover and then start dating healthy after toxic relationship. So for some reason, I guess I'm the guinea pig. So I'm the one that <laughs> is doing it and then writing it. And I've been given this amazing talent to write this way and to write my true feelings and how it really feels for me. You know, and like meeting somebody for the first time or listening to trying so hard to listen to your gut that's now scrambled eggs. You know, like, okay, this person seems really odd, this person. And then sometimes you pay attention and you save yourself and other times you make a mistake and you're like oh man 
So you're almost learning how to listen to your gut again by making these mistakes. Yeah. So I definitely have a lot of experience with making mistakes. <laughs> um, you know, that's kind of a, a good thing in a sense for my readers and for my followers because now they can see what this looks like. And, you know, there's a chapter I want to write about, you know, just the basics, like what to be aware of, like not to overthink, not to do these different things. And because when you get out of the toxic relationship and once you realize like what you're recovering from, then you approach relationships in a completely different way. So for me, I was codependent. I was needy. So normally in a relationship, I was known to, and I've only had two, my marriage and then the abusive one that I was in. I would call a hundred times a day. Where are you going? What are you doing? Who are you with? What's going on? All of those things. Now I learn the hard way from both ends. I don't like doing that to someone. And I sure as heck don't like someone doing that to me. So being able to find your freedom with someone else seems to be the sweet spot that a lot of people want to get to, but they're so insecure or codependent, or they have all these triggers and traumas going on that they didn't heal and recover from, that they don't know how to approach a relationship in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. And they can try to control it or keep it under wraps. And then a few months in, they just explode. And all of a sudden a guy is with the crazy girl or a girl is with the crazy guy because they're trying to change their ways, but not in the right way. True. That does happen a lot, actually. And even with like, it's funny you say that you've got a couple and then one looks like they're crazy, like even in that regard, but also to the one where, you know, it makes me wonder sometimes when people say, oh yeah, my ex was crazy. Cause I'm like, were they crazy when you met them or were they crazy when you left them? You know, like right. that's a big telltale sign. And yeah. a lot of codependents are made out to look crazy after their relationship has ended as well, because the narc has pushed all the right buttons and triggered them in the right ways. And they finally, you know, had this big explosive thing and yes. the narc plays on that, you know, and calls them crazy, makes them look crazy and that sort of thing. So it's something to look for because I never used to think much about that until, you know, the last few years after my experience. And I was very lucky. I didn't, I wasn't really made, well, in my experience, I wasn't made out to look crazy, but I'm sure to all the people that he was in contact with, he was calling me those things, but I didn't yeah. give him any fuel to, I didn't fuel the fire. Do you know what I mean? But I'm sure he's yeah. probably made some stuff up or has played on something and made it, you know, look more exaggerated than what it is or whatever. And I've come to accept that that's probably the case. And I don't care anymore. That's fine. You think I have to read a book about him? That'll shut him up. <laughs> well, I've started a business based on my experiences with him. So that's a good starting point. Yeah, I think so. Because I think the thing is, a lot of the people who are like that, they're bullies. And once you expose them for what they are, they tend to go away. Or they can come yeah. back. Yeah. They usually come back. They'll come back like if something's not going their way or whatever, they'll come back. And yeah, they'll hoover back sometimes depending on the situation. Um, yeah. Even if they do have a new supply up their sleeve. Yeah, there's so much about that too. But the triangle, the love triangle and like, you know, all right. the other things they do. Yeah, it's insane. So when you've gone through all those things and you try to date again, if you haven't recovered and you don't feel, you know, like safe with yourself and if you don't trust yourself, then you will not be able to trust anyone else. I mean, there are so many times where I will overthink myself into a hole and I'm just like, oh gosh, dude, you got to stop overthinking. Like you just got to like let yourself live. But I've come really far with a lot of it. So it's a much better process to do while you're healthy and you're letting yourself live and letting the other person live and letting them make their own decisions. I think the biggest problem that we have is especially women, not all women, but most, we're so used to changing men or taking care of men that we don't take the time to sit back, let them show us like who they are and then make the decision of whether or not you want that person in your life. We're so busy being like, this guy has a great job. This guy has, you know, a nice face. This guy has nice teeth or whatever it is. And you're so desperate to have someone in your life that you want to change them to like conform to like what you want them to be. And yeah. once you start doing that, they don't want that. Like men are not stupid. They don't want someone coming in and changing them. But if we just give them the time to let them be themselves, really pay attention to what they're doing, keep our mouths shut about what they're doing, and then make the decisions of whether or not there's someone that can fit into our lives, I mm -hmm. think we'll have a much better time. I think if we take it a lot slower than what we're used to taking it, because society does teach us that if you're not linked up, that you're unlovable. Yeah. If you're unlovable if you don't love yourself. You know? Yeah slowing it down, paying attention, really figuring out like, you know, what this person's all about. And if they really honestly, truly fit with you. And if they don't, it's being brave and making that really tough decision to say, you know what, you're a great guy, but this just isn't working for me. 
Yeah, it's really about a lot of it does come down to self trust. And if you haven't worked through that sort of stuff, you can't have a lot of it because you're doubting your ability to pick a good partner and be in a good relationship. And yeah. it really is deciphering between your head and your heart and not just going off impulses because sometimes self control is really important, you know? And so it's like, you know, when you go shopping, like the impulse buys you, so you can sometimes regret later. But when you actually sit back and really think about what is good for you and what you actually really need, not necessarily what you just want, yeah, the result is <laughs> is better. Definitely it's better. So, so I was dating this guy, it would be about a year and a half ago now, and we'd been dating for like two months or something. And, you know, I didn't pick up on it back then, but he had narcissistic traits because I knew nothing about this back then. Maybe it was two years ago. Maybe, it, yeah, I think it was probably about that or longer, actually. He was kind of like the successful version of my ex, but in a different sort of way. Like he wasn't abusive or toxic, but he was very much like all about meeting his needs, you know, like not very giving and much more taking. It was funny because I kind of thought, oh my gosh, you know, like I thought he was everything that I wanted and like he chased me and, and all these things I thought were lining up and I was staying at his place and things were kind of not getting serious, but kind of stepping up a bit. We'd become exclusive. He gave me a key to his apartment. Um, wow. You know, all these sort of gestures were going around and whatnot. And then came around my birthday and I think I was turning 26, maybe I can't remember. And, but it was also my housewarming because I'd moved in. Oh, I think so. I can't quite remember now, but anyway, it was a big occasion. And I invited him along and he said, oh, parties aren't really my thing and all this sort of stuff. And my ears pricked up and I thought, maybe he doesn't really want to meet. Maybe he'll be a bit overwhelmed by meeting everyone in my life because we've only been dating for a short period, you know. And I thought, okay, well, he's not going to come. And I had made pace with that. And I wasn't kind of at that point where I was clingy and I felt like he had to come to my party. I was fine with him coming or not coming. In the end, he ended up coming with a present and came in, met everybody, all this sort of stuff. And I thought, this is good because this is going to cement our relationship probably even more. And then we are going to be, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend sort of stuff. Anyway, I thought the party had gone really well, but it turns out he had ruffled a few feathers with my parents and also a couple of my friends. Oh, no. But here I was oblivious thinking, oh, it's great. He gets along with everybody, you know, he fits right in, da, 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 da. Long story short, we ended up he kind of like things were starting to go on the downhill a little bit. I could start to feel it. Wasn't quite sure why. And when I was talking to my friend over the phone about it, she's like, Olivia, it's like you've already committed to him and he hasn't really even asked you to be his girlfriend yet. Like, cause he was that guy that would just say that you were his girlfriend, other people, but never actually asked you. And it's like, no, we haven't made this decision together yet. You can't just call me your girlfriend, you know, all this sort of stuff. Cause he said to me one time, he's like, he's, when we're talking about this, he's like, what do I get if I call you my girlfriend? Like, what do I get that's different? You know, like kind of like as if like he wanted more from me if he gave me this label or this title, which for me was very off-putting because I'm like, this is a very much like a using sort of mentality, not like a giving one. When my friend said that to me on the phone, she's like, why have you already committed to him? Like you've only known him for a short period of time. He hasn't really proven himself enough to really be boyfriend material for you, but you've kind of already just assumed automatically in your brain that you're meant to be together. She's like, you need to kind of step back and start really looking at him and not just what you want to believe is him, yeah. you know, and I was looking at all the positives and I wasn't paying attention to any of the negatives. And I was doing the same thing again, where I was ignoring red flags. And in the end, it didn't work out, thank God. But, you know, you start to notice that within yourself. You start to think, okay, when you fall in love, it's got to be really quickly. And, you know, it's got to be, you know, this, that and the other and blah, 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 blah. But this friend was really good because she pulled me aside and was just like, hang on a second, wake up to yourself. Don't just assume that this is it for you. Like you need to really step back and look at him in all these different situations. You've only seen him in this one light. She's like, what about what happened at your party? What about all that? You know, so it was really good having that friend that could really open your eyes more because you get very tunnel visioned when you think that you really like someone and you think that they're right for you when in fact they actually may not be. Yeah, I totally agree. I think like falling in love is a lot like falling asleep. It happens like slowly and then all at once, you know? where you got to like really take your time and, and look at stuff. And I think a lot of times we look at the good in the guy or the lady or whatever, and we don't want to look at the bad because we don't want to see someone that we care about in like a bad light. But like yeah. for me, I mean, I have like a pro con list going every day. Like you've got to look <laughs> at like the good and the bad. And the thing about it is like when you look at the bad, it's not necessarily a negative thing when you look at the bad. It's like, okay, if you're dating someone and they hit you, obviously that's a huge bad. But if you date someone and they drive too fast. Yeah, that's not great, but is that like a deal breaker? So you've got to look at the bad to see which like level bad it is. After being through that toxic relationship that I was in, I mean, at first everything is red. 
couches are red, houses are red, everything is red, all the flags are red <laughs> until you start trusting and then regular color sets come back. And I think for someone who's been in a relationship that's been so abusive, learning to trust again and opening yourself up to love again is the bravest thing you will ever do. Mm -hmm. Knowing that you can get hurt again. But if I wanted to tell anybody any like advice about dating after a toxic relationship is if you do it again, it's hundred percent worth it. And if it ends and you have a broken heart, it's not ever going to be as painful as it once was. That's it will never like that again. Like you will be hurt and it'll sting, but you know what? You're going to get through it and you're going to be like, wow, this was terrible, but I'm okay. You will never be hurt in that way ever again. So it's worth the risk. And if someone breaks your trust, you get back up and you try it again. And the other thing is it has nothing to do with you. So if you're dating someone new and they cheat on you or whatever, then it has nothing to do with you and everything to do with them and their character. If you find that they're lying to you or doing these things, it has nothing to do with you. And in that toxic relationship, I think we were definitely conditioned to believe that everything that went wrong was because of something like you did wrong. Mm. And that's what it is. So it's like, once you have your self love and you believe in what you want and what you deserve and you get your boundaries, then you do it, you know, buckle it up and take that little tiny, small baby step and just take that plunge because it is worth it. Yeah. I think after my break, cause I haven't fallen in love again since my breakup with my narc, my ex fiance. Mm -hmm. And I think I know now I'm like, I know that no matter what shit he puts me through or whatever I go through in my next relationship or whatever, like firstly, I should stipulate, I wouldn't let that happen again. Let's just put that out there. But the second thing yeah. is that I know that if anything went wrong and we broke up or whatever, I know I'll be okay. Cause I've been yeah. through like the worst breakup of my life and I won't let that happen again. And I'm not going to get into a relationship where it's worse than what I've already gone through because I have standards and boundaries now. I think it's good to know that, you know, what you just said, actually. So thank you for sharing that with my audience because I know they'll benefit from hearing that, you know, and that's the thing. It's life. You've got contrasts of good and bad and evil and great and da da da. Like not everything's a hundred percent perfect all the time. Not everything's a hundred percent shit all the time because we wouldn't stay with our not right. exes if they weren't bad all the time. They show us a little bit of good and we cling on to that. You know, there's, we have had good times with them, even though they've been probably fake or, you know, scripted or they've been fabricated or whatever. But, you know, there's contrast in life all the time, good and bad all the time. And, you know, if you get your heart broken, it's worth it because at least you've had all that love in the first place before that happened. You know, like it's part of living. It's part of life. Yeah. You don't want to get to your deathbed and go, I didn't really experience life at its fullest. You know, yeah. it's a roller coaster. You're going to have good. You're going to have bad. You're going to have beautiful. You're going to have ugly. It's a contrast. Like you haven't fully really lived if you haven't gone through everything. Yeah. I think that first time that you fall in love after your toxic relationship, that's the one that's going to break your walls down. And that's the one that's going to lead you to where you need to be. Yeah. So like you may not be like in love, but you're with someone and then, or even just talking to someone and then all of a sudden they're gone. Like you're going to feel like you're heartbroken. Like for me, I was talking to someone for a little bit. And then when it ended, like we never even like met up. And when it ended, I was like, oh my God, this is horrible. But then when I was finished wallowing, I was like, holy cow, this dude broke my walls down. Yeah. And now I'm ready. You know, now yeah. I feel like more prepared for this. So like with each person that you meet, each person that you date, if you allow yourself to learn lessons, figure out where you went right, where you went wrong, realize you're in charge of everything that's going on, you're going to be okay. And it's going to mm -hmm. get better. And you're going to have more fun with it you're not going to be as worried about getting hurt because I mean, getting hurt stinks regardless. I mean, you're going to want to cry your eyes out and watch sad movies. I'm sure or however people do it, but it's worth the risk. It definitely is. I think that's good for people to hear because sometimes they think, Oh, they've broke my heart and trampled all over it. And I don't want to ever trust or love anyone ever again. And if you're thinking that you're still in the recovery and healing stage, yeah. you're not out of it yet because you're not meant to go, yes, I want to love again straight afterwards because you have been hurt. It's a natural response to go inwards and pull away. But when you've come out of that and you are in a healthier mind space and you're ready, you've done your healing and recovery and you know that you have and you're ready and you're feeling like you can self-trust, that's when you know that you're ready to move on to dating, not straight away. You know, it's yeah. never a good idea to get out of a toxic relationship and go straight into another one. I would even say within six months minimum of a relationship with someone oh. else, depending on the length of the relationship and all this sort of stuff. And I probably shouldn't have said that, but I just think there needs to be a period of time where you're 100% focused on you and yeah. yeah, like lick your wounds and actually get better from that experience and learn the lessons that you needed to learn so you don't carry them into the next relationship. Yeah, I think so. I mean, for me, I like, I mean, I 
tried to shove myself into dating right away and turned into a complete nightmare, which was laughable. <laughs> but then I took a good solid couple of years off where yeah. I really, that wasn't ready. Because along with the relationship comes a lot of responsibility. Yeah. So it's not just going to the movies and celebrating Valentine's Day and that sort of thing. It's a lot of responsibility in a relationship. And if you're bringing in your past trauma and you're, you know, basically punishing the new person that you're with because of what the other person did to you, no one's going to have a good time. So not only are you going to get screwed up, but that person that you're dating is also going to get screwed up. And they're going to be like, what the heck was that? When they don't really know exactly what was going on. So taking the time to really figure out if you're ready to date or not is the way to go. And the best way to find out is just to go on a date and see how you feel. And if you feel like, okay, yeah, this wasn't for me. And it went south pretty quickly. Then, you know, you know, this isn't for me, but you know, if it wasn't so horrible, try it again. And if it was bad, take some more time off and heal. But I would hate the fact that like people didn't want to try it again because love is so amazing. Mm. It's such a great feeling. I mean, it like brings out so many great things. It's not love that hurts you. It's the person that hurts you. Love has done absolutely nothing wrong to anybody ever. Love is a great feeling. Love is a, is a great place to be in. But if you don't love yourself, then, I mean, if you're not at a point where like, you're dating someone and you walk in on the person you're dating and they're with someone else and you can't just simply turn around and go home and just never speak to that person again, then you're definitely not ready. If you're the type of person that's going to freak out and throw stuff, yeah, no, mm. you're definitely not ready. So you've got to be able to be secure with yourself to be like, oh yeah, no, this doesn't feel good and I'm leaving and just leave. Like if you're name calling, if you're freaking out, if you're stalking, oh mercy, um, you oh, may sure. not be ready to date. No, I agree with that. And do you touch on that in your book? Uh, my second book, yes. My second book is going to be really juicy. <laughs> Sounds interesting. Super Can I get my juicy. hand on a copy? <laughs> yes, I'll have to send you one. Um, I'll have to listen to it on Audible because I love listening to stuff like podcasts, books, because I don't have a lot of time to sit and read. I, I listen to stuff on the go. So I might yeah. have to download it off that. Yeah, and it's my voice. So it'll be <laughs> I love your voice and your accent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I love your accent too. It's a great accent. Yeah, and the book is quick. It's less than four hours. So it doesn't take oh, too perfect. long. Oh, I yeah, like that. That's um, good. Time efficient. Yeah, it's a pretty good one. But the second book, yeah, it's going to be really juicy. I'm, I don't have a title yet, but I'm working on it. So it's a lot of uh, a lot of new people I'm bringing in, a lot of really interesting stuff. That I was writing it yesterday and I was like, I cannot believe I'm writing all this stuff again, like yeah. exposing myself. But I think it'll really help a lot of people get through all this. Yeah. Story is so powerful. Like story is so relatable as well. Like you can say, this is the best way to get over a narcissist or a toxic relationship. One, two, three, four, five. But if you actually give the background of your history, like it's something for people to connect with, not just to be told what to do. So when you have the both together, it's a lot more powerful, which is really yeah. great. So where can they find you, Kelly? Um, you can find me. I have my website is kellysmithauthor.com. Yep. I'm on Instagram as well. Mm -hmm. And that's Kelly Smith author as well. Twitter, Kelly Smith author and Facebook, <laughs> Kelly Smith author. So anything. Wow. You can, um, I would show you my book, but since this is not in the video. You can show me. Oh yeah. That's yeah. cool. So it's blue, everybody. And there's actually like a mirror, like a reverse mirror oh, yeah, in the yeah. car. Review mirror. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Really cool. Um, I like the title too. Oh, thanks. I actually talked to my publisher the day and I was like, I want to change the title. And she's like, what? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, no. Why? So, the previous one. I, I think it's great. Well, it said since I was, I didn't get my way. I was just going to write a whole other book. <laughs> and this time you have a publisher, like, whatever. which is awesome. Like, I like to get what I want. So I'm just going to write a whole new book and call it whatever I want. But yeah, you can find me on uh, anything Kelly Smith author. Check out my book. Definitely. I'd be really interested to see what you think. Yeah. I'd love to read it. Yeah, I'll I'll definitely it. download it and I'll let you know. In fact, I might even have you on like a Facebook live in my group and we can talk about it. Oh, like, that would be amazing. Yeah, yeah, it will be a good idea. We'll look into that, yeah. everybody. But yes, thank Perfect. you so much for joining us today, Kelly. I really appreciate it. Lovely to talk to you. Yeah. And I'm sure lots of women will get lots of value out of hearing this. So that's my main goal. Well, thank, thank you so much. I appreciate um, your time and having me on. This is so amazing. I'm glad we could finally nail down a time and actually make it work. And Yeah, definitely. I agree with that. It's different when you're just messaging someone to actually seeing them, like not face to face, but we're over Zoom, everyone, in case you didn't know. So we can actually see each other when we talk about this. So yeah. pretty cool. But yes, thank you so much. And we'll talk to you later. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye, Kelly. Thank you so much for tuning in. I would really appreciate it if you guys would leave me a review on iTunes. I ask this because your review will help the success of this show so that it has the potential to reach many more women out there who would benefit from hearing this message as podcasts have an algorithm too, just like Facebook and Instagram and other platforms out there. If you enjoyed this podcast or something has resonated with you, then be sure to subscribe so you're informed of every new episode that is released and so you don't miss a thing. And share the love by passing this on to someone you know who would benefit from hearing the free content of this podcast. 
I know that I personally would have benefited from hearing something like this when I was going through my own healing and recovery journey, and it would have propelled me forward further to feel a lot better sooner. So for more beyond this podcast, find the Red Velvet Woman Facebook page, ask to be added to the exclusive group, and come hang out with me on Instagram, where you will find uplifting, thought-provoking quotes and pretty pictures, as well as my link to my YouTube videos. If you want to reach me, you can do so by emailing me at theredvelvetwoman at gmail.com. Until next time, much love, Olivia. Thanks for listening.